our heads before the Lord in heaven. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Our gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you with these words that are ancient and mind. We come with hearts that are yearning to see that in our lifetime. Lord, we are, your word says you are jealous for us. Lord, we are jealous for you. We are jealous for your glory in our midst. We're, glor- we're, we're, we're jealous for your glory to come down upon our city, upon our leaders, upon our preachers. Lord, I am not a prophet. I can't see the future. But your word says that through the Holy Spirit, I, just a simple and lowly shepherd, Lord, I have the mind of Christ. And I thank you for that, Lord. According to your word, Lord, I have the spirit of Elijah in me and upon me. I have the spirit of John the Baptist in me and upon me. And therefore, Lord, I pray with John the Baptist that you would let me decrease and that you would increase. We pray that you would pour out your spirit upon this place, O Father, that we might see Christ Jesus this morning and that we might glorify Christ today. And so we ask you, Heavenly Father, here in your presence, Lord, we, we, come, we come on our knees because you are the high King of heaven. Lord, we come on your knees because your word tells us in Exodus 34 that you don't let the righteous go unpunished. You're a righteous judge and you don't let sinners just pass on through. You deal with, with judgment. You, you bring judgment. You, you execute justice upon the nations. Lord. Yet, through the gospel, we see that you come near. So we don't just come on our knees, Lord, but we come running as children into your room as though a child were running into the living room of his father who is reading or watching television or talking with his wife. Lord, we, we're here because you're our father. And your word tells us to pray in this way, where we hallow your name. And so we say, you are holy, God. And then to make our needs known by saying, your kingdom come and your will be done. And so, God, there's great mountains that are obstructing the vision of Christ Jesus and so many churches this morning. We pray that you would put those mountains down. Lord, where there are preachers who are not preaching the gospel, we hear Paul ferociously saying, let them be accursed in God. We say, get them out of the way and bring good preachers of your word in, O God. And Lord, where there are valleys that are so deep that our brothers and sisters here at Trinity Fellowship can't look They can't squint their eyes and see the throne. They can't see the kingdom far off. All they can see is the depth of the valley that's in between you and them. Lord, we pray that you would cause that valley to be brought up. Better yet, Lord, we pray that Christ would be seen as the bridge across that valley. So that there would be no one today who leaves this house without knowing Christ Jesus. Lord, we are praying for nothing short of the third person of the Trinity to do miraculous miracles. 
Lord, people are flooding into houses of worship of one sort or another across the world today. Some are bowing before Allah. Lord, some are bowing before an anti-Trinitarian God. The Jews are not recognizing the Messiah. Lord, there are people who are flooding into so-called churches today, looking for a miracle, looking, looking to see the dead raised. But your word in John chapter 3 talks about a greater miracle that says we must be born again. So Lord, we pray that you would be performing the miracle of regeneration that is giving us new life today. Those of us who are dead and that you would do that through the preaching of your word. And those brothers who have come in limping, we could say, because of the difficulties of life or because of the weights that they feel on their shoulders that are burdening them and pushing them down into the ground. Lord, we pray that they would feel the weight of those pressures in life taken up off of their shoulders as they look to the cross and see that those very things have been nailed to the cross of Christ and we do not bear them any longer. Lord, we're asking for miracles today, but we're asking for Trinitarian holy miracles. Would you do this work as only you can today and would you breathe upon this word afresh? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. This is no formality today. Uh, I say that many weeks. You might be tempted, oh, to say, he says that every week, it is a formality. But this is not a formality. What we are about to do is open God's word. And God is going to address each and every one of us personally. This is not like dry bread that was left out on the counter two days ago only for you to return hungry and open your refrigerator and open your cupboards and find that there's nothing available to eat. This is the living word of God. It's alive and it's meant to feed us. God is about to address us from his word this morning. So let's take a posture of humility and open our ears and listen to what he has to say. This is the climax of our week. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Amen. There she was. The crowning jewel of all creation. Nothing that had been spoken into existence was like her in any way. Can you imagine all of creation bending down to look Upon her loveliness. Five glorious days of sublimity had passed as God had taken that which was not. And spoken it into existence. And then came the sixth day. And he did something altogether unique. He did something different. He made male and female. And he made them in his image. First came Adam. And he was given a very 
clear mission, according to Genesis 1, 26, to take dominion over everything in creation. He was to be a mirror or a shadow of God in creation. Just in case you're concerned, there's a heresy floating around that teaches that we are miniature gods. We're not saying that, but he was as God, a representative created in the image of God. And Adam was altogether wonderful. But then God saw that it was not good for man to be alone. And so he made Eve to be Adam's helper. She would help Adam in this mission that was given to him by God to take dominion over all the earth. There she was, naked in all her splendor, without shame, without embarrassment. Together, they were mirroring and reflecting God's glory to the rest of creation. Nothing in creation was like these two, created in the image of God. Indeed, they were like God. They were like God. And in the same way that God cannot lie, Adam and Eve were prohibited from only one thing. They could not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told them that if they did eat it, in the day that they ate it, they would surely die. And then in Genesis 3 came the tempter, the serpent. And he twisted God's words and he enticed Eve with sin. And this is what he declared to her. You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing between good and evil. And Eve, at this point, she should have silenced Lucifer at that very moment and said, I'm already like God. But Eve's problem is abundantly clear in the text. She did not want to be like God. She wanted to be God. And so she took of the fruit and she ate. And she gave some to Adam who was with her. So don't go blaming Eve. Adam was right next to her, keeping his mouth silent like so many husbands do. And then God comes walking through the garden. And he cries out to Adam and Eve, who are now hiding because of the shame of their nakedness. And he says, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And Adam responds, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree to eat. And I ate. Do you see what Adam is doing here? He is isolating himself from his wife, first of all. He says, my wife is the primary problem. So now it's just me, Adam, and God. She is on the out. But then he goes and he isolates himself one step further. And he says, the wife, which, by the way, you gave to me. And so what he does is he pushes himself away from God and he pushes himself away from Eve. And now he's the only righteous person in the room. He's a man of conceit, false glory. He justifies his sinful actions. Wars. And rumors of wars. Where do they come from? What is their origin? We can take a line on and pin it on every war in the history of mankind and trace it back to this start here in the garden. It was here that we find the birth of selfish ambition. It's here that we find the origins of conceit. And sin did give birth to more sin. And in the second generation, we don't just see Adam throwing his wife under the bus and going and turning from God, but we see Cain and selfish ambition, and in a fit 
of jealous rage, he rises up and he strikes his brother dead. And so goes, you might say, the majority, if not the entirety, of the Old Testament. Brothers against brothers. Think of Joseph and his brothers. Think of Jacob and Esau. Sisters against sisters. Think of Leah. Think of Rachel. Throughout the Old Testament, we see tribes against tribes and nations against nations. Even those who would claim to be God's chosen do not live according to God's plans. The Israelites were raised up for a very clear purpose. Genesis, 1, Genesis chapter 12, 2 tells us that their purpose, their goal, the reason God had chosen them was so that they could be a blessing to all of the nations on the earth. But as we approach the end of the Old Testament, we find that even God's prophets have gone astray. Jonah would rather die than go and be a blessing to the inhabitants of Nineveh. And these Israelites, brothers and sisters, in Trinity Fellowship in 2021, they are meant to be a specimen for us. Do we have any scientists or doctors in the room? I know we have doctors. You know, what we do, what's, what doctors do is they take one sample of cells from an individual and they, they look at it by itself and it's a specimen. And that, what they discover from their research on those cells is applied to the rest of humanity. This is a sample that's true of humanity. That's what we find throughout the Old Testament. The Israelites were a sample, a specimen for the rest of us in humility, humanity. What is in them is in you and me. The root of all devastation is this. Selfish ambition and conceit. And this is what Romans 1.18 summarizes for us as ungodliness. The utter failure to be Godward in all that we do, say, think, and believe we are bent inward because of the fall and we're consumed with self my image my career my reputation my desires my 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 and it's been going on since the garden it is the reason behind every war you know, I had a very good friend in high school and in college who believed that the world was quickly getting better. It was going to a better place because man at his core was fundamentally good. He believed that the day would come when we as a world would get past wars and violence. That is because he believed what I just said, that man at his core is good, that he's straight. But you know what? They said the same thing before World War I. And they said the same thing before World War II. That those would be the wars that end all wars. That man had so progressed in his thinking. He had so evolved in his lifestyle and in the way he thinks that we would get past that point. But since the end of World War II, there have been numerous wars and genocides. The Rwanda genocide, the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea, Vietnam, Burma, Syria, the war we've been having in our own country. It is because we are bent. It's because you are bent that there is divorce. There is sexual abuse. There are pornography addictions. It is, it is what is behind all complaining and all bickering and all discord. And the Bible teaches us that God hates it. And on account of selfish ambition and conceit, otherwise articulated as ungodliness, according to Romans 1.8, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. You know, when I was 
In junior high, there was this bracelet, some of you might be too young for this, that said, WWJD, what would Jesus do? My brother, when I was growing up, said, I'm going to make a different kind of bracelet that says, WIFM, W-I-F-M. Oh, and I said, I said, what does that mean? What is, what is WIFM, and, and where are you going to sell these? And he said, WIFM means, what's in it for me? <laughs> The reason why that was funny is because it's true. Like even the guys who are wearing the WWJD bracelets, we can we can see this like would Jesus, would Jesus curse me out the way you just did, bro? If human history teaches us one thing, it's that we're twisted. And that over the last thousands and thousands of years, nothing about who we are at our core has changed. Our corrupted and our fallen nature is a part of us. Listen. Two months or a month and a half? Ginbot, you bet that. Right? It's going to be hot. The dust is going to be falling. The bimbies are going to be eating. You and me. Right? It's coming. Just get ready. There's your prophecy for today. <laughs> Come back in two months and tell me if I was right. Gimbot is coming. And here's the thing that you don't want to do when you're in Gimbot. You don't want to sit outside at the cafe or at your house and eat tibs with meat mita in the sun. And you don't want to drink a cup of espresso in the sun. Because the next day, you're going to wake up with Mitch. I think we're all in agreement as to how you get Mitch. Meat, meat, ha, and oil in the sun, and coffee in the sun. Don't do it. And when you get Mitch, it kind of depends on where you get it. If you get it at the top of your lip, you know, it's bothersome and you don't want to be in pictures. You say, I think I'll pass on this group picture. But what about when it gets in the corner of your mouth? <laughs> And you try to eat, and to some degree your mouth still functions, right? If, if you're not from Ethiopia and you don't know what Mitch is, we're talking about the Superman of cold sores, okay? The worst cold sore you've ever had, that's what, that's what we're talking about, that's what Mitch is. But when you get it right here, it's hard for everything to function. You can still taste, you can still smell, you can still chew, but everything is affected. We have Mitch on our heart. We have Mitch on our soul. And everything we do in life is affected by it. That's what our inward and twisted, corrupted, fallen nature does for us. The Bible teaches us that the inward corruption is so deep that we can't even make ourselves right. This is Romans chapter 3 verses 10 through 13's summary of human nature in his natural element. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. An open grave. Have you ever smelled as the body inside of a, 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 a you know, what do you call it? The Sa'an thing. Whatever it is that they put the dead people on. Have you ever been there when it opens? Yeah. The smell is horrendous. The Bible says that's what's coming out of you and I. Our, oh, our, our hearts, our throats are an open grave. The venom of asps is under their lips. Isaiah 64, 6 goes one step further and it says, All of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Not to be too crass, but the concept that the original reader would have received upon reading this was that these rags are the rags of a woman during her menstrual menstru menstruation cycle. I did not make that up. I wouldn't say that from the pulpit if it wasn't true. 
It says, we all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. According to these verses, even what we do right, our right deeds are still still has so much wrong in it that it is considered to be disgusting in the eyes of God. And so to be clear, these verses are not just getting at our external behavior, what we do, but our inward meditations, the inward meditations of our heart. It is getting at our motives. All in an effort to reveal to you and I that we are bent and twisted at our core, bent by selfish ambition, twisted by conceit. And yet in our text this morning, we find that Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in verses 3 and 4 of our text for today, he writes to his dear friends in Philippi, please follow along with me, starting in verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of the others. You see, in Philippi, the unity of the church had come under threat. The threat facing Philippi was both from outside, which is external, or from within, which is internal. And our passage for today is really just a continuation of our text from last week, when we started in chapter 1, verse 27. There in verse 27, we were told that We are to live lives that are worthy of the gospel. This is done when the church is united and standing firm in one spirit. We're talking about the local church here. We're not talking about all the churches of Addis Ababa coming together in a council. We're talking about one church, your local church, standing in unity. That's how we live lives worthy of the gospel. And in this unity, we strive for the advancement of the gospel. Shoulder to shoulder, like soldiers fighting for the gospel. This is all done in the light of and in the face of external threats of persecution. In verses 27 through 30, the threat to the unity of the Christians at Philippi was external. It was coming from the Roman cities, citizens in the Roman city of Philippi. You see... These men and women would have referred to Emperor Nero as their Lord and Savior. The Emperor of Rome was their Lord. And they would not have taken very kindly to these Philippian Christians who referred referred to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Who, by the way, one day... Every knee will bow before him and every tongue will confess him. Our passage for today is simply a continuation of that text from last week in chapter 1, verse 27. But now Paul turns from the external threat from outside, that external threat to the unity of the Philippian church, and now he turns to the internal threat to the unity of the church. And brothers and sisters, as I look around Addis Ababa, and as I look back over my life, I want to tell you that I think that the greatest threat to the unity of this church is not from outside, but from within. What is threatening the unity of the church? The great threat to the unity of Trinity Fellowship is this sin, a sin that we are all prone to according to the text of Scripture. And let me be clear, I would definitely include myself in this category, for it is something that is in each and every one of us, including me. And this is the sin of selfish ambition and conceit. What exactly is ambition? What is Conceit. 
We see the heart of selfish ambition and the example of Adam and Eve, for whom it was not enough to be like God, but as we stated earlier, they wanted to be God. As one theologian states, selfish ambition stands at the heart of human fallenness, where self-interest and self-aggrandizement at the expense of others primarily dictate values and behavior. Selfish ambition, by definition, is the act of putting your own desires and needs before those of others. And then conceit. What is conceit? Well, conceit is a step further down that road of depravity. Its literal meaning is empty glory. Empty glory. These are people who are faking it. They're self-confused. They might even be confusing themselves. This can be seen in an individual's life who thinks so highly of him or herself. They're what you might call self Blessed. They are people of self appointed honor. Such conceited individuals have an exaggerated view of themselves. They walk into the room and they feel that they are the most important person in that room and that they deserve that which they do not currently possess. They are entitled. Well, what does this practice of sin look like? How is it manifested? It's one thing to talk about it, but let's describe it. What does it look like? How can I spot it? In two words, it's complaining and arguing. Selfish ambition and conceit is manifested through complaining and arguing. That is how verse 14 in our chapter describes it. It's it's described as grumbling, which is complaining, or disputing, which is arguing. So let me ask you a question. When was the last time that you grumbled? When is the last time that you grumbled? Argued. When was the last time that you were complaining? When was the last time that you were disputing? That is an evidence of selfish ambition and conceit in your life. Listen, we have a song in the West that little children like to sing with their moms and dads and it goes something like this. Who took the cookies from the cookie jar? Was it you? No. Was it you? No. The reason we have this song is because this is a a big category of, of thievery. Taking the cookies from the cookie jar because it's hard to spot. But then, oh, you find out who took the cookies from the cookie jar when you see that oily crumb on your children's finger. And you see chocolate wiped across their face and they say, I didn't take the cookies from the cookie jar. And you say, really? Friends, if you have been grumbling, if you've been disputing, don't fool yourself. You took the cookies from the cookie jar. We're talking about you. We, not, we need not think of the faces of other individuals in our lives. Our own faces are the perfect examples of this. We, like Adam, we, like Eve, are bent. So as you go through the remainder of today, and as you enter into next week and go through the week, do you find yourself complaining, grumbling, arguing? Know that you too have selfish ambition and conceit. And if you don't take care, brothers and sisters, this is extremely important. If you don't take care, if you don't watch out, if you do not stop it, it has the power to rip this church apart. 
It has the, per the power to tear up the lives of the precious individuals who are currently sitting in this room. Paul declares that we are to do nothing. 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 Nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. So next time you find yourself tempted to take offense or next time someone does something that makes you unhappy or makes you feel like you've been wronged. Is it not possible to do what Paul commands the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 7 when he says, why not just be wronged? It's better to be wronged. Don't stand up for your rights. Don't put your rights and opinions before the unity of the church. Just be wronged, as Paul would say. He goes on to say, In humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So our unity, in other words, it comes via the vehicle of humility. Unity comes through humility. Say it. Unity comes through humility. Turn to your neighbor and say, Unity comes through humility. I didn't hear you. I heard my wife and A.B., but we work together. <laughs> We've seen it now stated in the negative, and now we're going to see it stated in the positive. We are not called to simply stop being selfish and conceited, but to consider others as more important than ourselves. That, by definition, is what humility is. It is thinking that Others are more important than you. This is not a self-esteem issue. And what we're not talking about is false humility where you never speak up. You never point out wrongs. No, 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 no. That's not what we're talking about. This is us seeing ourselves accurately. This is us seeing ourselves in the mirror and seeing the truth about who we really are. That we are able to say like Paul, whether we're leaders or whether we're cleaning the ground, that I am the chief of sinners. And the best way to know if you are walking out in obedience is to look at your time. What do you do with your time? This text is not saying to take your time and not care for yourself. It's not saying that at all. It's not saying don't give attention to your own needs. No, no, no. Don't hear me wrong and don't get Paul wrong. He is simply saying that we should consider others as more significant than ourselves. And this means looking out for the interests of others. Well, how do I look out for the interests of others? Two ways. Look and listen. As you come to church on Sunday morning, what's your posture? Are you coming with a posture to serve? Or like everybody that comes to this movie theater, Monday through Saturday, are you coming to be served? Or sitting in a theater, it would be quite easy to just come and be served. We look for the needs of of our brothers and sisters. Oh, this brother is sick. Can I take him a meal? Oh, this sister just had a baby. Maybe I could go wash her dishes. Are you looking for the interests of others? Number two, are we listening? One of the most humble things you can do as you enter into a conversation is ask good questions. Tell me. Tell me about this. Tell me about this. Oh, ask open-ended questions that can't be answered with yes or no. Ask questions that need paragraphs and sentences to respond. That is how we look out for the interests of others. We can't look out for the interests of others when we don't know. And the best way to know is by hearing people articulate those things. And the effect of being humble and of treating others as more significant than ourselves. That would mean, listen, this is a high calling. 
The effect of being humble and treating others as more significant than yourself would mean that at least 51% of your time and energy would be focused on others. It would not be self-focused. Well, Michael, how did you get that percentage? I don't see anything like that in the text. You guys are excellent at asking questions. You're already growing. I can tell. It comes from this word more in your text. Do you, do you see it? More. See, the minimum percentage for something to fall under the category of more is 51%. That's where more begins. So God is calling all of us at Trinity Fellowship to give a minimum of 51% of our time and energy to the interests of others. And as my old pastor who trained me and mentored me, C.J. Mahaney, would point out in a moment like this, he would say, Michael, do you want a good example of this? You need look no further than the lives of mothers with small children. A mother with small children is consumed with the interests of others. They wake up late at night in the middle of the night early in the morning to change dirty diapers, to give baths to children, to cook meals. And I don't have to look very far for an example of that. My wife would be a perfect example of that. Eden would be a perfect example of that. There's many ladies in this church and we thank the Lord for them, but they're a perfect example of what this sort of 51% of giving your life for the inter interests of others might look like. So in light of the biblical theology of selfish ambition and conceit and the history of man's selfishness since time began, I think the most appropriate question at this point, it's clear what we're to do, but the question now becomes how, Michael? I'm no better than Adam and Eve, am I? If I've been listening to your sermon correctly, the answer is no. I'm, I'm no better off than Leah and Rachel or these Israelites. So by what means will I find power to stop being selfish in my life? Well, last week we saw that when God gives us commands or imperatives, they are always in light of the truths or indicatives of the free grace of the gospel. This calling is to be something other than what we are by our fallen and corrupted nature. We're not doing it according to that nature. We're doing it in the light of and in response of the free grace that we've experienced at the cross on the hill called Calvary. And praise God for this. This is not a command that says, do this or you go to hell. Don't do it and you're in good shape. Sorry, how do we around? This is a response to the free grace of God. You see, verses 3 and 4 are simply asking us to live in the light of our experience of God as he's articulated in verses 1 and 2. And so I've flipped the way I preach these verses so we know clearly what to do. Now, how do we find out how to do it? Let's look in verses 1 and 2. So... If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation of the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and in one mind. This is such a unique verse, especially this first verse in this chapter. It's, it's extraordinary when you slow down and you listen to it. And you pay attention to what it says. Most scholars believe that this verse, verse 1, is a reference to the three persons of the Trinity. In other words, the encouragement we find in Christ. The love of God the Father is what comforts us. And it's the Spirit who we experience. And through Him, we know this love of God and unity with Him. 
One of the reasons I think that this is such an important verse is a parallel verse that you might find. Our brother Israel read it today in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. This is what it reads. Notice all three persons of the Trinity here. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. If this is the case that our text today is interacting with the three different persons of the Trinity, which I believe it is, Paul is speaking to the combined effect of the Trinity's unity on behalf of the salvation of sinners. He is looking at each person distinctly, each person of the Trinity, and asking the question, have you experienced that person of the Trinity? He's looking in the, in the, the Philippians' faces and he's saying, have you experienced the Father? Have you experienced the Son? Have you experienced the Holy Spirit? If so, then live in this sort of way. Do nothing of selfish ambition and conceit. Based upon the doctrine and the theological realities of each person of the Trinity, if you have experienced this in your life, which everyone who is a genuine Christian has, then you are commanded to live in this way. So brothers and sisters, let me ask you the question. Do you know the encouragement of Christ? I know that you know selfish ambition. I know that you know how to defend yourself and your rights when you think you are right. I know that you know what injustice in your own life looks like and the injustices you have received from those in your family, friends, and community. But the question on the table is, do you know the encouragement of Christ? Do you know what He did on your behalf? Do you know what He did with joy? Hebrews 12, 2 declares that Christ, listen, this is so important. Please listen. Hebrews 12, 2 declares that Christ, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Now that shame is not his, that's yours. And he endured your shame for joy. Brothers and sisters, can you imagine what it must have been like for Christ mere moments before He was incarnated? I'm talking moments before He became a baby in the womb of Mary. Can you imagine just a few moments before that? What if we could personify justice for a moment? Personification, Michael, what is that? Use some words that we understand. Personification is when you take something that does not have life and you act like it's a human being. An example of this would be a tree that talks to you. You're personifying a tree. You're making it like a human. We all know it's not a human. What if we could personify God's justice? Can you imagine Justice there personified in heaven. Moments before Christ becomes a man. Moments before stepping out of heaven. That second person of the Trinity. As he stands from his throne in heaven. To step down to earth. And justice holds out his hand. And he says to Christ. Listen. You are going to your own and they will not receive you. Think of what you're doing, leaving your throne for an animal feeding trough. And Christ Jesus, not deterred in the slightest, responds, For the sake of the elect, it is my joy. And justice responds, Listen. If you go down to that world, 
It is under the right and just judgment of God. You will be as a homeless man despised and rejected by men. They will hate you and they will look for ways to put you to death and that constantly. The very ones that you sustain by your omnipotent hands are the ones that, that are going to take your life. The ones who will curse you. The ones you gave life will take your life. And Christ Jesus says, it is my joy. And justice says, listen, you will be rejected by men. They will spit on you. They will bury a crown of thorns into your brow. You will perform miracles and even raise the dead, but it will be utterly meaningless to them. But more than that, your very friends will abandon you and they will betray you and that in your greatest hour of need. Only for you to in turn be forsaken by God in heaven. You will be abandoned in a garden and the pressure of God's wrath will begin to crush on you so that you sweat drops of blood. And Christ Jesus says, I will never turn back. It is my joy. They are my joy. And justice, he responds again and he says, but they are in the wrong and you are in the right. And they have been rebels choosing their own selfish ambition. Theirs is an empty and a hollow glory. Yours is the kingdom and the glory. Will you be wronged to make them right? And Christ Jesus responds, it is my joy. And justice pushed back one more time. And he says, the angels they fall down before you here. They cry, holy, holy, holy. The Father's white, hot, passionate love, it has always been centered in you. If you do this thing, if you take it upon yourself to pay all their debts, hell itself will be let loose upon you. The very wrath of the Father will be poured out out from the very throne onto your body, which will be nailed to a tree. You will be cursed and every drop of your holy body will be drained for the very ones who deserve this hell. And the very ones for whom you died, they will look to their own insignificant and offensive so-called good works and righteous deeds. And they will try to justify themselves in the eyes of the Father. They will step over your free grace. And Christ takes that step to earth and says, Who can think of anything that they have done? Any lingering sin in their life that is not covered by such an extraordinary act of love. There is more grace, as one famous theologian said, in Christ Jesus our Lord than there is in you. There's more grace in Christ Jesus our Lord than there is sin in you you. Is there any encouragement of Christ? Is there any encouragement in Christ? What about the Father? Have you known the comfort that our text is speaking about? Have you known the comfort of the Father? Oh, if only we could interview him. If only we could bring some heavenly journalist to put that microphone in his mouth. And ask him the questions we long for. Can you imagine what that journalist might ask? The journalist puts his microphone to God the Father's mouth and says, How do you feel about these individuals who say that they are your elect? Your so-called church? Indeed, they are pitiful, are they not? 
especially these young men with their pornography. And these young women with their miserable vanity. And God the Father takes the microphone and he says, what more can I say than what has already been said? I have given them that book which declares all of this. What more can I give them than what has already been given? I've given my son in whom I've eternally delighted in. I sent him out of glory so that I might bring every last one of them to glory. The spirit he too was sent from me also that they may know the depths of my love for them. And the interviewer takes the microphone says, and says, yeah, 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 right, sure, but, but some of these very ones have sinned this week. They have done things that your holy law forbids. Has your heart not become hardened towards them over this last week? Surely you do not love them anymore. And God the Father grabs the microphone from that interviewer and he says, Oh, if only my children knew. You know, they sometimes look to Christ thinking He is the kind and gentle one who loves them. But that I somehow, I'm up here and I still hold a grudge. They think I'm waiting to strike them down. They do not understand that the cross originated right here. Right in my heart. The cross did not win my love and affection, but it was because I loved them that I sent my one and only begotten Son to the cross for them. Every sin that they have ever committed, every sin that they commit now, every future sin, past, present, and future, it has been banished from my mind. It has been thrown as far as the east is from the west. My cup of wrath, it's been drained to the bottom because Christ, my son, drank it until it was gone. I have no wrath remaining towards my children. I love them with the same love that I have eternally loved Christ. And when I look upon them, I see Christ, my son's spotlessness. Friends, do you know the comfort of your father in heaven who no longer harbors any anger towards you? And finally, what of the spirit? Have you known the fellowship, fellowship or the participation of the spirit? Is there anything in you that looks to Christ and says, he, he is my salvation? That is fellowship of the Spirit. Is there anything in you that would look to the God of heaven and say, He is my Father? That is the fellowship of the Spirit. Do you at any time find yourself wanting to read the Bible and to pray? That is the fellowship of the Spirit. That is the fruit and the effect of the Holy Spirit fellowshipping with you. Do you have sin in your life that saddens you? Maybe, maybe you feel like it is getting the better of you. You feel convicted and you wonder, am I really a Christian? Am I even elect? That is the fellowship of the Spirit. That is conviction and it's from him and it's not a bad thing it is not supposed to cause you to doubt if you are really a christian it's supposed to make you run to jesus christ the savior of your soul dear listeners do you know any of this do you know the affection and the sympathy of the trinity towards you they are nothing like us there is no selfish ambition or conceit to be named among them. They have every reason to be selfish and ambition, but there is none like God. 
in humility. They have treated you and I as though you and I are more significant than they. At least in their actions. Oh, they were in the right and we were in the wrong. All the rights were on their side. But because you were wrong with Christ, he gave up his rights to make you right before God the Father. Have you experienced this at all? Listen and listen closely. There is no command here in our text today for those of you who knew nothing of free grace. Hear me say that again. There's nothing, there's no commands in this text for you today. If you know nothing, if you have not experienced this free grace, you are not being called right now to humility. You are not being called to stop your selfish ambition and conceit. All that you are called to right now is to fly to Christ Jesus as fast as you can so that you might know this loving, free grace, this infinite grace that of a God who once he takes hold of a man or a woman, he never lets them go. But if you already know something of this free grace, then listen, Trinity Fellowship, make my joy complete. Yes, this text teaches us that a church should seek to give their pastors joy. It's right there in your text. Teaches that a church should seek to give joy to their pastors. But it also teaches that Paul was a man and that there were certain things that contributed to his joy. Namely, the church. No, his joy was not solely based upon the church, but their lives contributed to their pastor's joy. And what made him so joyful was when the church lived their lives in light of the free grace of the gospel. When they maintained unity through living lives of humility. Friends, I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, it is My joy, the joy of my life to be the pastor of Trinity Fellowship. It's and it's fun. And you you make it a pleasure to pastor you. You make it so easy to pastor you. I I look forward to seeing you every day of the week on every Sunday. There have been many pastors throughout history for which that has not been the case. So let me close by saying, make my joy complete. By living in the light of the free grace of the gospel. Let's pray. I, King of Heaven, I can think of brothers' faces in this church. I can think of sisters' faces in this church who so often flip-flop these verses. And think that you love them based upon how they have performed throughout the week. If they were 100% pure, then everything is okay. If they have done well with the commands of Scripture, then all is well. But if their performance has been less than good, or if they fall into a fit of despair, I have done my best to preach free grace today to make it abundantly clear that we don't do anything to deserve the love and the affection of each person of the Trinity, but that the gospel originated in the heart of the Father because He loved people, the people in this church, people like Esaias, people like Caesar, people like Tamarin, people like Joe and Kala. People like Daniel and Yesekor. That their performance is not what gives them peace with you, but it's, it's Christ, Lord. Would you give us as a church to live lives worthy of the gospel? Would you give us lives that look to the Trinity and His great work for us and live in the truth of what you have done for us? 
We pray this in your name's sake, that you might be glorified, because you are the only one who is worthy of all praise, all adoration, and all thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.